Welcome to Student State TV. I'm Executive Editor Michael Johnson. I'm joined today by Daniel Squadron, the State Senator who represents the lower financial district of Manhattan and also parts of Brooklyn. Thank you very much for joining us. That's right. You're uh, headquartered in my district. Yes. So uh, thank you as a constituent <laughs> for uh, realizing how great it is. Yeah, it's a beautiful office here and it's a beautiful place to go to work every single day. Um, this past weekend you had your community convention. It's, uh, I guess I could say, kind of a glorified town hall. Um, obviously you're not running for anything right now, but you do this every single year. Why do you do it? What, what inspired you to do this every single year? You know, the idea behind the community convention is we invite everyone in the district to come. They hear some speeches and some of the things you, you normally hear at a political gathering, but then they also break up into discussion groups where the participants, the constituents, uh, drive the conversation in 15 subject areas. We then come back and kind of welcome everyone, have some great food from around the district. It is a way outside of the context of elections to engage people in the process of government. And it's hard to do. People are busy. There's a lot of levels of government, a lot going on. One Sunday a year, we say, look, you come. We'll make it easy for you. And you tell us your priorities. And you know what? It really does help me direct myself, both in the district and in Albany, every year. It's a great thing. We had over 350 people this year, great group of special guests, uh, including uh, Senator Chuck Schumer. Yep. And um, people always have a great time. And it's just a great way to have a two-way communication with my bosses. So before we get to Senator Schumer's comments at the uh, convention, what was the, what was your takeaway from the uh, meetings and, and from what the uh, constituents came back to tell you about? What was the big issue that was on their minds? Uh, well, look, this year we had a lot of people really concerned about neighborhood quality of life, zoning issues, uh, more than we have in some recent years. We had more folks interested in parks and open space than we have in recent years. And every year we've got a big focus uh, from our constituents on transit. You know, buses and subways are sometimes things that, you know, people in the uh, elected world don't want to talk about. You know who does? People who depend on buses and subways to get to work, to get around the city. And there's real concern over quality funding over time, buses and subways. So and then also we had Senator Schumer who spoke and gave the keynote address. Uh, what was his message to your constituents? And what was um, kind of a, was there extra buzz because of uh, his... Uh, reported ascendancy to the leadership of the Democratic uh, Conference in the U.S. Senate. Look, there's certainly a lot of enthusiasm about that, a, a lot of uh, references to it, if it happens, how great that'll be both for New York and I think for the entire country, without a doubt. Uh, you know, one of the great things about him is he's become a national leader. He is still so focused neighborhood by neighborhood. So he talked a lot about resiliency efforts, which is a citywide and a statewide issue, but also an issue in my district in Lower Manhattan especially that has real need. And, uh, you know, he's focused on it on the neighborhood level, on the federal funding level, and everywhere in between. So he talked about that. And then he also, you know, did sort of provide a, a really inspiring vision of why it is uh, Senate Democrats uh, should, should be in the majority, both here in the state mm -hmm. and federally, uh, and, and how important that is for the middle class. So now getting to um, Senate Democrats here in New York State, you guys obviously uh, in the minority, just went through the budget process. So most of that, you kind of have to just advocate for things you want, talk to your friends in the assembly and try to get them to, to help out. Overall, how do you feel like the budget turned out for uh, your, your interests as a lawmaker? Uh, look, you know, I, I, I do think that a lot of the story of the budget is things that weren't in it. Uh, whether it was closing the so-called LLC loophole that allows uh, unlimited anonymous uh, contributions to pervert the elect electoral process, whether it is funding the MTA capital plan, raising the minimum wage, uh, those things uh, weren't in there. One thing that is, is a, a project of mine that I'm really passionate about is uh, early childhood uh, home visiting. There's a program called Nurse Family Partnership that I've worked in a tripartisan way. In the Senate, we're tripartisan <laughs> with the yeah. three conferences. Uh, and we got more funding for it than we ever had before with support from the Assembly and the Governor. Uh, we're not nearly where we need to be, but that's a kind of life-changing program that you don't hear much about in Albany because if there's not a partisan fight, sometimes it gets lost. And, you, and that was in the budget or that was, got passed in the budget? Yeah, that, that was a, a positive thing in the budget. That along with, with some funding for NYCHA for New York City Public Housing, yeah. which has just been uh, defunded from the state level uh, for years. $100 million for NYCHA was also great news. Yeah, and also has been defunded from the federal level for years as well. Yes. Do um, Just really quickly on NYCHA then, do you feel that the, there was, it seems like there was a fight over whether the money should be spent by the state uh, to do the repairs or whether it should be given to the city and given to NYCHA directly. Are you okay with the fact that the 
state is kind of administering those funds? Look, better with 100 million than without it. Mm -hmm. I am concerned about the steps, and I, I talked about this on the Senate floor. I think there are six steps between now and when that money can move. I'm concerned that it gets caught up in red tape there. We all have to make sure it doesn't. If that money is spent on the ground, making life better for the nearly half million residents of NYCHA, all that process won't matter. If it gets caught up, the fact that we appropriated it won't matter. It's got to move. Definitely. Um, along with housing, there's rent regulations that are coming up at the end of the year. There's the 421A tax credits. Uh, how do you see this fight kind of playing out? I mean, obviously, as a Democrat, as a somewhat progressive Democrat, you are advocating probably for stronger rent regulations, but your colleagues and the Senate, uh, the Republican colleagues in the Senate seem to be probably not for that. Do you think that there could be some movement there? Look, it's critical that we don't just extend rent regulations, that we also strengthen them. You know, the fact that we have vacancy decontrol, which uh, means that when an apartment gets to a certain level, it's no longer regulated and it no longer goes back into the system, creates all kinds of bad incentives throughout the process. Incentives to destabilize along the way, incentives to do work or claim work that otherwise shouldn't happen, and incentive to push people out of their communities and of their homes. So we should get rid of that. Uh, the reality is we know that the Senate Republican Conference has uh, been an opponent of this. You know, it, the interesting thing is it's not because they have constituents, uh, for the most part, who are impacted by it. And, and I think that's one of the really disturbing things. You know, when you have uh, a group of folks who are overwhelmingly, not entirely, but overwhelmingly not even affected in their districts by something and still are opponents of it. And, you know, I think it's one of the signs of what's wrong in Albany. And that's when we get to the kind of the campaign finance thing. So you're alluding to the fact that a lot of the uh, Senate Republicans, you know, have um, interests or are, have campaign funds that come from real estate interests that don't that want vacancy decontrol. They don't want to have stronger rent regulations. Look, I don't know New York City elected officials. Uh, who stand up and say we shouldn't have rent regulation. Mm -hmm. I don't know New York City elected officials who uh, believe that this has been bad for our city. We know that it has been a vital part of making our city uh, survive, not as much as it should, but survive as a place where people of different incomes, different walks of life can make a life. And uh, you know, when you have such consensus among those who are directly affected or near consensus, you have to say, what, what do you care? You know, I, I, I think there's a lot we have to do in Western New York and in the Southern tier. Mm -hmm. And I try not to say to the elected officials who represent those areas, here's what you need. No, I completely understand that argument. Um, moving on, you have any other issues that you want to push for at the end of the session? Is there anything that you think that you can get moved through? It's obviously tough as a minority member in the conference, but if you uh, you know work with your Assembly Democratic friends, is, is there something that you think that maybe will move at the end? Look, another critical issue is uh, gender, the Gender Expression Non-Discrimination Act. What this does is it extends basic rights in housing and employment and public accommodation to transgender New Yorkers who right now don't have them. Most people, when they hear this, are shocked. You know, they, they don't like the idea of a group of New Yorkers who uh, can be fired from their job or evicted from their home just because of who they are. Uh, and yet, in New York, that's still true. It's the shame of the state. One of the really surprising things about this is in localities around the state, there are local protections. And uh, many of those areas are represented by uh, my Republican colleagues who still have not yet said they're in favor of this. And I think this is one of those issues that with focus and attention does have a chance to pass because I, I can't imagine that, that people want to live in a state with this kind of shame. You know another place, by the way, that has uh, protections for, for transgender folks? Vico, Kentucky. A uh, population, I think, less than 2,000. Uh, you know, I don't think we should be behind Vico, Kentucky when it comes to basic civil rights. Um, is, there, is there a sense that you think that this is just a situation where if it comes to a vote, your Republican colleagues would most likely, or there would be enough of them that would vote for it? It's more just in the behind the scenes um, machinations of trying to get something to the floor that this like generally dies? Or do you feel like that you still have to work on some of your colleagues on the Republican side to convince them to vote for this? Now, look, there's no question that an education uh, is important, that uh, folks need to understand that this is a significant number of people, that the consequences of not having these protections has meaning in people's lives. You know, uh, people need to understand that, and that's my job as, as the sponsor and the advocates as well. Uh, I do hope that if there's a vote, uh, a large portion of the Senate will not stand up against basic civil rights, which is all this is, will not stand up against uh, e equality of access, which is really something that should be 
uh, in this day and age, something that we can all stand for. One of the problems with Albany and with the Senate is, you know, uncomfortable issues sometimes, even critically important ones like this, are much easier to kill, as you say, in a back room than they are through the sort of transparent, open process of legislating. And I remember the gay marriage vote, when this the same thing happened, there was no one who really spoke against it other than, you know, your uh, colleague, Reverend Diaz, who had religious beliefs against it. But, um, you know, the first time when it was voted down and the second time when it was passed, um, there was no other people who vocally spoke on the floor to oppose this. And I think that maybe kind of speaks to the, the mentality you have. This is something that people are a little bit uncomfortable to talk about. Um, do you think that the, you're going to need the governor to push this to make this happen? Is that something where you're, you're going to have to make sure that he's your big ally to make sure that it gets to the floor for a vote? Look, you know, the governor has been supportive and, and vocal about this. It, it was included in his, uh, his beginning of the year state of the state messaging, uh, which was great news. Uh, there's no question it's going to have to be a coalition. You know, I, I, I'm doing everything I can with my colleagues. I have other colleagues who are as well. Brad Hoyleman is another senator, Dick Godfrey in the assembly. Uh, there's a great group of us. Uh, and the governor, uh, we hope, continues to be part of it. He has been. We hope he continues to be as we get to the end of session, because I think we're all going to need to push to make sure this issue is addressed. State Senator Daniel Scrudden, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me.